the vaccines work, which this sign says that they do, then why do people who have had the vaccine need to now wear masks the same as people who have not had it? Because the public health uh, leaders in our administration have made the determination. Democrats are set to take control of the U.S. Senate, House, and the White House. This will go down as one of the most progressive administrations in American history. God willing, everything is on the table. You now can pass things without a filibuster threat. That's right. Oh, you'll regret this, and you may regret it a lot sooner than you think. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve... Welcome to the Ruthless Variety Program. It is a big day. We've got a lot to cover. I want to get into that Saki thing. We're going to talk deep on it because it just enrages all of us. Yeah, uh, I, 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 as soon as I heard that, I, ever since I heard that, actually, I've just been like on a tear. Just I've a got a burn, lot to say about that. A real burn in the old smug's gullet, which <laughs> is exactly what we love here at the Variety Program. But first, we have some housekeeping items. Big announcements. Big announcements. We're going to tell you where you need to go in Iowa. Folks, Iowa is honestly just around the corner. And it's going to be, I mean, I'm beyond excited for this. Some details. So we'll be having a Minion meetup the night of August 17th at the Iowa Tap Room. That's 8 p.m. Central Time. It's like the preview, right? Yeah, Where yeah. You, you come, you drink some beers with us. And you just get wild. It's gonna be it's gonna be great. I'm, everyone absolutely needs to be there. And then we'll be at the fair itself on August 18th, and you can find us at Jr's South Pork Ranch. Uh, I mean that that's gonna be fantastic. Listen, the I I don't know if I can say enough nice things about Jr's South Pork Ranch. These folks are just absolute patriots. They are hosting us. They are opening. They're opening basically with us. I mean, this this is a new establishment, and they're hosting the Ruthless Variety program and all the minions for a big time. It's, I, I, it's great. Like I said, you know, you really have to be there. We've already heard from a bunch of folks who are, who are flying in, driving out there, and the folks in Iowa. There's he, a the, huge every, crew in Iowa. Dude, every person in Iowa who's reached out about this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Yep. Oh, it's amazing. Plus, my my pals from Mini are going to show up. So you're all in line. Oh, man, that's going to be wild. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be good. All right, so let's get into this disaster with Jen Psaki answering Peter Ducey's question about why, if we know that you've had the vaccine and you're not going to be sick and you're not going to be hospitalized from the Delta Comfort Plus, uh, why would you need to wear a mask? And her answer was because we said so. Straight up. And uh, uh, there's so mu- there's so much that makes me angry about that <laughs> because it connects to so much that enrages me about how, how Democrats are acting, you know, what their mission has become of the left. And it's just, it's very telling, you know. I, I, I think, uh, should I, I, should I, I'll just get into it. I think we should just get into it. Go off, King. Yeah, Go off, let's King. Let's do it. Okay, so number Look at him, he's clearing his desk. He's getting he's getting, <laughs> taking a step back. I wish you all could see this. Smug is winding up. So, uh, in, to me, I am sick and tired and infuriated by what the left has become at this point. The the, the liberal agenda, the the this administration, they are unable to solve any of the problems that Americans are facing. So their approach is to try to demonize a group of individuals. They're trying to create this like out group that it's okay to hate. And it's that group that's causing all of our problems. And it's it's uh, not that this administration is ineffective. It's we have to create this narrative of that democracy is under threat. We have to keep you people scared so we can control you. They have to keep telling us that, oh, these group of Trump supporters. Terrorists, they call them. They called them terrorists. Can you believe this? This is how crazy it's gotten. They're calling Americans, you know, like half the country terrorists. They're saying that, oh, wow, the reason we have to do all of this is because of Trump supporters. That it, it, it makes it so clear because this is not based on data or evidence. This no, they is, need a boogeyman. They need a boogeyman. This is based on their efforts to try to have the public not focus on why food prices are up, gas prices are up. That's not what they want the public focusing on. They want to say, 
oh, all the problems, it's it's because of these Trump supporters. Right. It's because they're 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 terrorists. They need to scapegoat an out group and say that there's this creeping fascism that's invading America. And the reason why we can't pass HR one, the reason why inflation's up, the reason why, you know, you know, America's in the toilet under the Biden administration is actually, it's not because of the Biden administration and unified democratic government. No, 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 no. Yeah. It's actually these people that we want you to hate. And that's the thing is, and, and, the, and how I said earlier is I actually sat down and I took a look at the data, right? Uh, one, so smug can do that. And not everybody knows, not all listeners of the variety program <laughs> appreciate that smug actually has some amazing capacity when he applies himself to looking at data. Yeah, when I get mad enough, I, I, I <laughs> you know, I'll, I, I actually, I actually put it together. So Bloomberg uh, had this incredible. Uh, th- they have an updated map um, of the United States where they show state by state whether you can break it down by uh, various racial groups, whether they're above or below the average of of. Uh, the number of people who are vaccinated. You can go state by state. What'd you find? So this is what's so interesting to me is because the 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 narrative that the left has created and that the media ran with is, oh, these are these are Trump uh, supporters who aren't getting the vaccine, and it's because of them that we're going to have just endless variants, and and all our problems are are because of them. No, if you if you if you look at the demographics, and I, I invite everyone to do so, you'd also probably have heard that. Oh, there's also uh, vaccine hesitancy among uh, black Americans. Um, that doesn't really fit the narrative. But here's the thing, folks, is this is not about ethnicity. This is not about your political beliefs. You overlay that map with median income. Ooh. And it fits to a T. This is about a group of individuals in this country that the government for generations has left behind that society has left behind, you know, everyone thinks, oh, you know, after after 2008, after that financial crash, w- everything was back to normal. You know, that's not for every, every, it wasn't back to normal for everybody. And for a lot of folks, especially in these areas, the lockdowns hurt a lot. They don't trust the government anymore. Bingo. They don't trust any of our institutions it's anymore. It's not vaccine and hesitancy, how could, right. it's institutional hesitancy. Right. It's because these people have been left behind forgotten by the government, and now the Dems are trying to scapegoat these people. They want you to hate folks who are poor. That's these, their agenda. Th- these these folks have were forced into lockdowns and said, you know, you, you're not going to be able to go back to work. You're not going to be able to go back to your job uh, unless you get the vaccine. And now Saki from the podium says, oh, well, if you got that vaccine, you still got to put the mask back on. And it's like all you're doing is reinforcing their belief that our institutions have failed us. That's a hundred percent. And I, I want folks to try and, and imagine what, how, how life looks like for these folks in these areas. Okay. They, they were, they saw over the past year, basically they lost their jobs and the government was like, we'll give you, we'll give you a little bit. Okay. Uh, it's an allowance. Yeah. You're now going to live off of an allowance. That's how this is going to work. What else did these folks see? You know, the, uh, over the past week, you, you've gotten quarterly reports from a bunch of companies. You know, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, they reported record, record profits. Google, Google made over $60 billion in profit in a quarter, right? You know how much money Amazon made? Enough for Bezos to be the richest man on earth after a divorce. <laughs> okay? Right. Th- so so if, if, if they were working at, a, at, at a, uh, if they had their own, you know, mom and pop shop, if... It, it, anywhere that they worked, lockdowns happen, they lose their jobs, and, and what ends up happening? Oh, Amazon. Well, Amazon's going to do great, right? They've seen corporations have, have made record incomes, record record profits. Yeah, they see those, those, those corporations' profits go up. They lose their job. They're stuck in their house, and they turn on the news, and there's BLM riots all summer, all summer. And you got the journalists saying, well, none of this— contributed to the spread oh, of covid oh, no, no, the, we've sure. got texas democrats coming in to washington dc spreading covid everywhere 
and and Saki says, "Oh well, we can't tell you who's who's been exposed, and you know we're not we're not going to reveal those people's names." Do you remember when Donald Trump was president, oh. and you know you 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 had a ceremony in the Rose Garden, and you had media outfits putting up diagrams and coloring still people red it. if they were if they were exposed possibly, and they were calling them super spreader events. And if you're a person, you know who 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 doesn't trust our institutions, and you look at at that situation now in Washington D.C. for the Texas Democrats for Nancy Pelosi these people and you suddenly realize there's a different set of rules for them than there are for you yeah there's a different set of rules for the blm rioters than there are for you when you've lost your job i mean how can you trust anything bingo last summer you know imagine being imagine being a a, 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 you know if if you've got if you've got your own store you've got your own small business and it's burnt to the ground and you're told by dems you're told by the media hey uh, that's okay because you have insurance, right? It's democracy. Yeah, you have insurance. They're told you have insurance. Yeah, that's, pro- your, yeah property your, crime isn't violence. Your yeah. life's <laughs> work is set ablaze, and you're told, yeah, well, you have insurance. Imagine what your what your feeling is like towards all institutions, but towards that's, the media, towards politicians, towards the government. So your point, your point there is the is the underlying point of all of this, which is they would have you believe this is a Trump supporter issue. What Smug has just outlined is that the vaccine hesitancy is equal amongst black Americans, white Americans, Hispanic Americans, if you don't have money. Bingo. If you don't have money, right? This is not a partisan issue. This is a financial issue. It's about trust of government. If you are one of those black-owned businesses that is in Georgia, that you saw the all-star game move because of a voting rights law that absolutely makes no sense protesting in the first place, but you lost your business between a combination of COVID and then that, you're not trusting a damn thing. You're not You're not going to listen to Jen Psaki or any of these CDC idiots who've told you to mask, don't mask, double mask, don't mask, triple mask, go in your home, stay there, and we'll send you an allowance. And that's the thing is, is that's the icing on the cake is this Jen Psaki thing of, of – now they're going and flipping the guidance again. And the reason they always tell you is experts. We have the experts. It's like they think they're the voice of God going down and saying, oh, stupid, you know, peons, listen to us. We, of course, we flip flopped from the guidance we gave you about a month ago, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You should just listen to us. Take your allowance, you know, and, and, and just do as we tell you. And that's how it works. And by the way, it's still Fauci. It's still Fauci, it's the same guy, right? The, the same guy that Kamala Harris said that she wouldn't trust in the, in the distribution of a vaccine because she would be concerned about anything approved by the Trump administration is now set in the same policy for this administration, but it's, it's now it's expertise. I don't even understand what the policy is at this point. Are we, are, we, are we supposed to eradicate all viral uh, infection in America? Because, I mean, like, like, just take a step back again, and we've said it before on the, on the program, but the whole point of flattening the curve was to stop overwhelming hospitals. Remember, I mean, there was a time where we were concerned we are going to run out of ventilators. Remember? Right. right. And that was the point. You know, you stay home two weeks to flatten the curve, prevent these hospitalizations, right? We're not seeing a huge uptick in hospital, hospitalizations, right? Right. No, now we're talking about, like, infinitesimally small, like, numbers which are now talked about in percentages to say we're having a 100%, 200% increase, right? Which in cases. Like 9 to 18. In cases, right? And, and the fact is, if you're vaccinated, chances are you're not going to die from this. It's infinitesimally small. Like, when did it become the government's role to stop getting the cold? Right. right? Like, when did right. it become the government's role to say, like, you have no say in your health decision whatsoever that we have to make sure you don't become ill. Well, and like, look, I got the vaccine. I happen to think vaccines are great. I would recommend you get the vaccine. But when you look at a government that tells you you have to stay in your home for a year and you have to wear a mask and then you got to wear two masks and then you got to get this vaccine. And then now they say, well, you got to put that mask back on. I can understand why people don't trust their institutions and are hesitant to take the vaccine. And 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 don't forget the folks who are uh, in this government now. We're also telling you, 
uh, last year, I would be hesitant to take any vaccine right. that's developed under Donald Trump. <laughs> I mean, it's straight up. It's, it's truly remarkable. And if these people think for an, a second, single solitary second, that the American people who were put through 2020, where I understand how the government made some mistakes because we had a 100-year event and there was a pandemic we didn't know how to treat and ultimately we were concerned it was going to kill millions of Americans. Like you take extraordinary measures, but you also learn something along the way, right? You understand who vulnerable populations are, who it actually is killing, right? What hospital rates are, are being affected. You learn and you adapt, right? If they think that we're going back to March of 2020 or April of 2020 in terms of how we're protecting this population, they are out of their goddamn minds. It is not going to happen. There is not a single American that I know who's going to go triple mask and sit in their basement, watch their livelihoods be completely burned at the stake because the government tells them to. None of this is based on science at this point. Just frankly, none of it is based on science. Because you have... Um, you've got Biden CDC director on mask mandates for kids saying, quote, we don't have any evidence that the Delta variant makes kids sicker, but they want mask mandates for all these kids when they go back to school. And, and remember last fall, Fauci told all of us it was perfectly safe to send your kids back to school. Right. Right. The kids are not transmitting this in schools that it's fine. Right. So what happened? Oh, uh, the teachers unions uh, talked to the CDC and there had them go. change their guidance. And they go. begged for millions and millions of dollars to, you know, say, oh, well, we're going to reopen schools. And then our government gave them that money and they said, actually, you know what? Go ahead and pump the brakes. You know, right. the ventilation systems. I don't know. You know, these schools have never really been safe. That's what they actually said. That's what they're saying. Yeah. I mean, it. it it makes me so irrationally angry. Yeah. I mean, it's just how much can you screw with your average American before people just say, no. That's the thing is, look who this administration listens to. They listen to the teachers' unions making all the calls. That's who they're listening to. They're listening to their machine that they have in place to keep them in power. They're not listening to, you know what? This isn't about political ideology this isn't about race this is about our government has failed these people how do we show them how do we show them they shouldn't lose faith in us and, and that ultimately is the sad part of all of this is you know democracy is about trust yep and and when you're in a situation like we are now uh, a lack of trust leads to non-compliance yeah. You know, I mean, like, seriously, like, like, like if, if you are one of those people who's seen everything from the financial crisis to the pandemic and you're a lower income person who's been screwed by your government over and over, you and think over. you're going to comply with this bullshit? And it, it but it, even if you back it out, I mean, part of the reason that some populations feel a lack of trust is because they've been completely failing them with a policy agenda. Yep. I mean, look, if you're paying seven times what you paid for a piece of meat a year ago, yep. right? And nobody's talking about that, but they're talking about putting double masks on your kid if they can go to school at all and then teach them CRT, you're pretty pissed off. Like, why aren't you talking about the fact that I'm draining my paycheck for household items that used to cost cents on the dollar? It, like, who do you think? Who do you think has hit the hardest when, when, when the price of gas is like triple what it was a year ago? Who's hit the hardest? It's not these. It's it's not this administration. What's his name? The transportation uh, transportation secretary was complaining. Boot what you can't find edge. a decent place for forty five hundred a month? Yeah, unbelievably Straight out faced. of touch. Out out of touch. It's insulting. It's insulting. These people are they're ghouls, is what they are, and they're trying to demonize people who have been just hurt again and again and again. By failures of institutions who, look, a year ago they said, oh, if it, you're a nut job if you say it came out of uh, a lab. Now that's the prevailing wisdom, okay? So so maybe a lot of these people should stop trying to look for a group to demonize based on political beliefs because that's essentially what the media and the Dems have become now. Is, 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 <laughs> how do we, how do we blame oh, I like that. That's and, a, a very, very good use of the soundboard. And, and, and that's my rant. That's what that's what I had to get off. Ah, uh, thank you, King. 
God, that just felt good. That was barrel of the back content right there. Barrel of the back content. And I love the fact that you went to your old uh, finance days and queued up <laughs> Bloomberg and looked through the stats. Look at you. Look at you. He's a real expert. He is. Oh, it's so fun. All right. <laughs> The crowd goes wild. The crowd goes wild. All right. So um, let's get into a couple of other items here. I think that's a good segue, to be honest, to get into the Biden economy. Totally. Um, Because, look, we're still dealing with inflation. We're still dealing with all of these things, shortages across the board. I was on a flight the other day that had to be diverted to a new... uh, uh, <laughs> airport, you know, hundreds of miles away from my destination because of these fuel shortages. A fuel shortage. Our plane had to land, refuel, and take off again. This is a commercial flight. Yeah. You know, this isn't like a little, you know, Cessna. Well, and anybody who's made a flight reservation any time in the last three or four months, like, that's just the way it works. Like, you're, you're getting stops put in the middle of it. You're doing, like... Uh, but it's not just air travel or travel in general, fuel shortages. Like in this, the New York Post, I, I read that restaurants are having to pull seafood from the menus. Right? This is like the stuff you'd hear in like Venezuela. Right? Yeah. Where we're like three or four years ago, we're like, man, look at Venezuela. They have to pull seafood off the menu. And now it's America. But like what the hell are we doing? You got Congress sitting here talking about spending another trillion dollar bipartisan deal to spend another trillion dollars on infrastructure which by the way if you find me a single american who's sitting by their sitting in their couch saying god i just hope they get this infrastructure deal done i will i will happily like invite them on the program and try to explain that to me cuz i don't know of anybody who gives a shit whether they get that done but maybe maybe somebody should look into the fact that you can't order a stick of furniture anywhere in this country and get it for a year and a half because of a combination of supply chain problems that happened because of COVID co- made worse by a government that is paying people not to work. Right. And we're going to spend trillions more. We're going to spend trillions more. Inflation is going to get worse. People are going to stay home. Like they're ruining this freaking country. They're ruining this country. And it's not in its household items. Right. Right, it starts with supply chain issues and it ends with, you know, wheelbarrows full of cash to buy stuff. I mean, I mean you talk about Venezuela. I mean, like, that's insane. I mean, that's what's happening yeah. here. You know, like, I was looking at a couple of these stats. Um, I mean, blue crab, right? I, I, I don't know, blue crab from red crab. or Oh, blue crab's crab, or crab, <laughs> crab is delicious. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, it's gone from eighteen dollars a pound to forty four dollars a pound. Jeez. Well, I hope it's delicious. Right? Like somebody explain that to me. Right? They've got uh fin fish and shellfish up twenty percent. I mean, this is just fish. Yeah. I, I tried to buy a piece of meat and it was double what the price is I paid for it three yep. months ago. Yep. You know, this is happening to every single thing in this country. Are we gonna talk about that at some point? Or are we just going to deal with Chen Saki telling us to triple mask? That's the thing is, again, and it's insulting. It's insulting. The only time they tried addressing this is when they're like, actually, uh, you know, your 4th of July meal could be 16 cents cheaper, which is a, a complete lie. Anyone who actually has to do their own shopping, unless, unlike these people in the administration who have an assistance assistant who can do everything for them. Everyone who's been to a grocery store knows it's more expensive. That's the only time they tried addressing it by insulting people. Who, it's the who same people have to pay for this. Yeah, the same people you talked about in the COVID segment. Yep. Right. I mean, t- genuinely, this has changed American politics. Republican Party is the party of the working class. I give Donald Trump a lot of credit for that. Yeah. But it is un. You, you can't dispute it. You can't dispute it at this point. Democrats are actively screwing working class Americans and then pretending like they're working on their behalf, which is like the most unbelievable backwards thing that that's happening in American politics. But you know what? I think people are recognizing it. You look at like all these elections that are happening. We had one three weeks ago. There's a bunch of special elections in Georgia. Republicans won all of them. Texas, there was a battle uh, last Tuesday between two Republicans that's, in a runoff. That's the, that's the story. They, they're trying to create their own narrative. The narrative is, in Texas, it was two Republicans. The Dems were <laughs> shut out. They didn't even, they didn't even, it was, a, it, it was like a, a, a R plus three district. 
and and even even in 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 in, in uh, you know liberal stronghold California, you're seeing the polling starting to turn on Newsom. It's edging up that he could get recalled. I mean, so yeah, we should actually talk about that just for a second for our California folks. We it gives me an opportunity to go back at Caitlyn Jenner, which I appreciate. <laughs> I now that she has decided to avail herself of the opportunity to leave the state and go to Australia and not actually campaign. Oh yeah, she's like filming Big Big Brother Some or something reality yeah. TV show. But like it just goes to show we were 100% right about our diagnosis of that campaign. Yep. yep. But now that she's left the scene, some polling came out. This survey by the University of California Berkeley Institute of Government Studies uh, found that 47% of likely voters say that they would back a recall effort. That's a hell of a lot closer that's, than any Democrat thought. Right there, wow. I yeah. mean, we're talking like they win 70-30 in California. All of a sudden you take a look at that, it's like, whoa. I mean, who would have thought, you know, rampant crime, homelessness, you know, fires, lockdowns. That may, You know, maybe folks aren't happy with that. Who would have thought? Well, New- Newsom's clearly feeling it. I think his team laid down like $10 million in <laughs> advertising on radio yeah. and television. Oh yeah. Yeah. But now, you know, I mean I think part of the reason for the for the surge is the fact that Californians are now also focused on serious candidates like the guy we had, Faulkner. Yeah. And like Larry Larry Elder. Yeah. And and people who they think can, can do the job much better than Gavin Newsom. And this thing is happening like look, I'm still skeptical because it's California. Right? So you I mean, look, Democrats are pretty <laughs> as you said, smug, they have a pretty good machine in California. So I'm not sure if we can get there. But I got to tell you, this has got to scare the hell out of them. I mean, that's the thing is that they're on the the Dems are on the losing side of issues. They can't talk about food prices going up. They can't talk about gas prices going up. They can't talk about how they can't talk about have, crime. They can't talk about crime at all. So, so again, the only thing they have in their playbook is everybody. You have to be terrified. Democracy is under attack. Uh, uh, this this group is who you should hate and who you should blame. Dude, Don't it's look it's, at us. it's it's just like what we were talking about on the last episode. When we read that story from Politico, oh, right? yeah. where where they're going to lay all the blame for their failure on on these voting election integrity, yeah, 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 these voting restrictions, oh, restrictions, right? Voter ID. And if you if you've read any poll on any of these issues, you see that they're underwater. But they're not talking about that. It's about the voting restrictions, <laughs> right? Just like smug, it's about the outgroup. Yep, the, it's the outgroup that is the problem. Meanwhile, meanwhile, not them. Meanwhile, old Babs Boxer, the former senator, got robbed this week. Yeah. I mean, that's something. Like, that's how bad it is. <laughs> I mean, think about it. They didn't even talk. Nobody's talking about that. Nobody's talking about that. A former senator was robbed. <laughs> Fully robbed. And, and, and like, they're like, oh, no, no, crime's not a problem. Yeah. Crime's not a problem. I mean, when is crime a problem for these folks? I mean, every single day, the people that I'm talking to have changed their life because of the crime. They don't go to inner cities after dark. These cities used to be the magnet of entertainment, you know, and people aren't even going to, they're not going to games. They're not going to the theater. They're not going, people are moving out of the cities. Well, yeah, there was a shooting outside the Nats game. So everyone had to leave that. Yeah. But I mean, it's just, it, to me, they're so freaking out of touch. They, but even California. And you got to feel for all those business owners, right? Because, and you had COVID and you had the lockdowns and all of that. And then they've been demonized by this administration. You know, I mean, we did that whole segment a few months ago, Stephanie rule, you know, talking about the PPP loans, you know, to keep people on payrolls and how horrible that was. Right. You know, and now you got violent crime coming up and their storefronts are right there in the epicenter of all of this crime. You're not going to get f- foot traffic. No. You know, I mean, it's just, it's incredible. Yeah. All right. So we got an, another topic that I think we have to hit here. It's immigration. Yeah. Yeah. Someone's got to address this because this administration isn't. I, mean, I think we've done a good job of, of interviewing a bunch of people who can speak firsthand because they've gone to the border. But like this story doesn't end. It's just constant. And it's not about, you remember during the Trump administration, it was all about us inventing a problem. Oh yeah. They said that, oh, it's, this is made up. This isn't an issue. Right. So they made reforms. They actually solved the issue. And then the Biden administration undoes all of it. Well, now... About 50,000 migrants who crossed the southern border illegally have been released into the United States without a court date. They're told to report to the ICE office. I just, hey, you know what? Come on in. Never mind the fact that you travel by foot a thousand miles fleeing your country. I'm sure you'll be back. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll go to your court date. I'm, I, 
after you illegally enter this country, I'm sure you'll abide by the legal process. Yeah, makes sense. And it says here, only 13% have showed up. Weird. 13%. Who would have thought? Weird. I can't believe the honor system isn't working at the border. <laughs> I can't believe it. I mean, how dumb are these people? But here, here's what the icing on the cake on that is. Uh, you, you brought up uh, during the, the Trump administration, uh, PolitiFact has this where they said Trump says people with immigration cases don't show for co- court. Biden says that's wrong. Biden is right. Around 60 to 75 percent of non-detained migrants attend their immigration court proceedings. <laughs> Insane. Wasn't true then. Wasn't true now. <laughs> and, and, and WAPO, uh, uh, Washington Post checker, uh, fact checker, gives uh, Pence four Pinocchios for his claim that uh, plus 90 percent of asylum seekers don't show up for immigration court hearings. <laughs> They gave him four Pinocchios. That's how this works. They're just they are straight up gaslighting. And now you see it happen right in front of you, and they don't want to talk about how out of control it's gotten. That they're they're so overwhelmed. Uh, it, 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 in this article, it says right here, a single stretch covering the Rio Grande Valley had twenty thousand apprehensions in a week. <laughs> twenty thousand in a week. I mean, and there's a humanity aspect to this that I talk. I've talked to uh, with our guests that like. They genuinely believe the Biden administration when they said, like, we'll welcome you with open arms. Yeah, but during the debate, every Dem, uh, when asked if, if you'd provide migrants with, like, uh, uh, money and, and, and health care and everything, if they come, every one of their hands went up. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, Kamala Harris has it under control, right, fellas? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. She, Liar. She, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> Nice. She, she she was like, okay, I'll finally go to the border a thousand miles away from, from where, uh, you know, the border's being overwhelmed. And here's the other kicker to this. Uh, I saw this article, I think it was AP, where they're like, there's no COVID testing being done at all on the migrants. There's, there's just an overwhelming number. So basically the situation is they, they, they see what, like 20,000? Are, were, were, were apprehended. Those are those are the, the the ones that they actually caught. They don't test for COVID. It's just like okay, and and, and, and uh, hopefully you show up to your court date. Well, even even worse than than the COVID situation, dude. It's like go back and and and, and listeners, if if you want to listen to an incredible interview we did with with Tony Gonzalez uh, from Texas's twenty uh, third district, it's it's great. But one thing from that interview that really s- stood out for me is he said. You know, in talking to county officials in his district, you know, he's like, dude, you know, pie in the sky, blank check. What, what's what's the number one thing you need? And they were saying body bags. Body bags. Body bags. Body bags. And this is the humane. This is the front line. This is the front line. His, his, his district is 40% of the southern border or something like that. And they want body bags. Ugh. That's how much Kamala Harris has this under control. Well, and all of them, by the way whether it was Tony or whether it was Governor Abbott or whether it was basically anybody we've talked to who has a, a border state, yeah, none of them, not one of them. I've asked every single one. Not one of them have heard from Kamala Harris. Not one. Not I from mean, her office. I mean, that should be her. like that should be a national news story. It, it, I mean, this is a, an, inc- an incredible crisis. And also that Gonzalez said, it's not even a partisan thing. No. Right? Like she hasn't talked to Democrats either. No. And colleagues. she's in charge of this. His Democratic colleague he was commiserating with because neither of them have heard from her. I mean, what, she's in charge of this thing. Imagine being in charge of something and the place where this is a problem, you have never talked to the people who represent that district. I mean, are you out of your mind? What? It's, it's beyond negligence. It's beyond, it's purposeful. Yeah. Like these people are really doing grave damage to this country. I mean, it's just, it is what it is. All right. I've, listen, we, this is big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we we, we kind of went off. We got to play a game. Yeah. We got to play a we game. We got to offset this anger with a little bit of candy. <laughs> let's do it. Let's, let's play King of the Hill. Oh, let's go. Whew. All right. So, uh, Holmes, you have our champion now. I do. Matthew Dowd. Matthew Mail Pattern. <laughs> Smug, who are you bringing to the table? The one, the only, Jen Rubin. Oh, she's back. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, well, let's go ringside. Ladies and 
gentlemen, your attention, please. It's time for our main event. In the red corner, fighting out of the Washington Post, a former champion returning for a chance to reclaim her crown, Jennifer Brainworms Rubin. And now, in the blue corner, fighting out of his own Twitter account and current, Champion of the world, Matthew Mail Pattern Down. <laughs> God, I just love, I just love that. I love it so much. I can't. I could listen to it all day. It just classes up the program. It really does. It really does. All right. So you have to go for, as our defending champion. You have to go first. Yeah. All right. Let's. And hear like it I home. tell you, with Dowd, I like the breadth. Like, he gives you a little bit of everything, so I'm going to give you different shakes here today. He's got, you know, think, a bunch of different things to, to it's like a from. It's like a tapas of takes. Yeah. Like little small plates. <laughs> it is. It is. Just enjoy a little of everything. A little taste of everything. <laughs> so, I started with this puppy uh, from the 25th of July at 7.47 p.m. It well into the cocktail hour. Uh, Matthew Mail Pattern says... As I said on MSNBC, the greatest threat to America is the virus of dishonesty. It threatens our public health, and it threatens our, the functioning of our democracy. The only vaccine for it is electing people with integrity and defeating the GOP. <laughs> no. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so the G GOP is the greatest threat to America because the GOP and the GOP alone have the virus of dishonesty. Yeah. Amazing take. I got, I got, a, I got a hotter take than that. Oh, so I'm red. excited. I'm going to go. I'm just dropping nukes on every one of these. Let's go. Jen just, Jen is really at it. <laughs> like those worms are just going wild <laughs> in her brain over the past week. So this one drops at 9.06 PM on July 27th. Uh, Jen Rubin sends out a link to this. She says, opinion, there's a better way to reform the filibuster. Here's how it would work, with the caveat that you only get one, quote, major bill per calendar year. This is like, <laughs> lady, this isn't a board game. This isn't a monopoly where, like, you can add a little rule, like, hey, just once a year, you get a little jail, get out of jail, free card. How is she, uh, like, how does the Washington Post in good faith, well, clearly not in good faith, Keep this person on the payroll for these kind of takes. Just a lunatic. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, just once a year, just a, just a, a once a year, this can happen. Like, what? Wait, can, this can, is... you, can you just read that again for yeah, me? Absolutely. Opinion. There's a better way to reform the filibuster. Here's how it'd work. With the caveat that you only get one major bill per calendar year. <laughs> Wait, so you can only have one piece of legislation every year? No, one piece that uh, filibuster doesn't apply to. Right, like a, you get like a trump card. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's like she, having a joker. Yeah. Yeah, she really thinks... Joker's like, wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Joker. <laughs> so you could say, you could say like, all right, I got one thing. HR1 is our first priority. You can't use the yeah, filibuster. Yeah, she's like, you know what? Maybe the founding fathers would have been like, okay, guys, but here's the thing is once a year you can play the Uno Reverso. Yeah, <laughs> once a year the rules don't matter. I love, I love it's democracy except this. Right, right. <laughs> As, what a return to norms, huh? <laughs> All right. So I mean, that's like fascism. <laughs> Let's be honest. I mean, what that is. And it's just proof that they don't actually give a shit Not at all least. about democracy. Not in at, at all. They don't care what the voters actually want. They don't care about any of that. What, whatever they can do to, to get to the objective that they want, they would do. That's if they exactly have the chance. Right. Um, all right. So so back to, to Dowd's take. I, I really do like that because it's an incredible metaphor and it actually relates back. The virus of dishonesty. Right. It relates back to everything that we mentioned here earlier on the on the program, right? It's like. You know, was PolitiFact 
part of the virus of dishonesty when they said that, oh, all, you know, all these migrants, they obviously go back for their court hearings. Was that was that part of the dishonesty? That's only the GOP. Or when they said, you know, get the vaccine, you know, that's how we get back to normal. And now they're telling us to wear the mask again. Like, is that dishonest? Only the GOP. It's only the GOP that is dishonest. Right. I mean, here's the thing is every dumb lib in this country is is running with that take. <laughs> Only uh, well, the so, queen, right, 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 right. So, only the queen can bring the worms so, the, so the, hard so that the, she wants a once right. a year Uno Reverso. The, ju- the judge and jury has to appreciate the Uno Reverso. Round one goes to Smug Let's and Jen go. Rose. Damn it! That means I'm going to have to bring serious heat. Yeah. Well, he also sold it really. I loved Uno Reverso. <laughs> it is good. I'm not even going to argue. I felt like I had a strong take, but Uno Reverso is really good. Okay, okay. So, so smug news now. Yeah, I'm wondering if I just go for the kill right here. Well, that's confidence. Well, you don't know what I have in my hand. You could burn, you could burn your kill shot on an amazing kill shot. Don't let him get in your head, smug. No, it's it, okay. Here, here's the one. So this is a quote retweet. She, uh, Jen Rubin, uh, on July 28th at 10 a.m. quote retweets uh, Frank Thorpe. He's a reporter. Pelosi on the backlash to mask mandates. That's the purview of the Capitol physician. Nothing to say except we honor it. Ruben, quote, retweets it. She is the best. Period after every word. <coughs> she is the best. Jen Rubin, Washington Post conservative dude, opinion. Dude, <laughs> dude. So, all right. so it's really good. <laughs> but I could stay on genre. And I feel like I could beat it on genre. Wow. Yeah, no, no, no. This is this is fucking amazing. All right. So Senator Mike Braun of Indiana, Republican, was reacting to a Fauci announcement about indoor mask mandates and like what that means. You know, new indoor mask mandates. And he says bringing back mask mandates will hurt small businesses just as they're getting back on their feet, right? Dowd responds, how exactly... Does wearing a mask hurt businesses? Uh, I don't know. If you own a restaurant, you're out of fucking business. It's over. Like, didn't we learn this in 2020? If you actually, if you have a restaurant and there are indoor mask man- mandates, you're done. You're out of business. How? And he says, how exactly does wearing a mask hurt business? I think we should start like a GoFundMe you know, to, to give Matthew Dowd like $50,000 to start a small business and see how fucking successful he is. <laughs> but you know? I, but I mean, the, 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 the level of obtuseness on something like that is like, how exactly does mask mandates hurt businesses? I mean, we, we just lived through it. We literally just we, did that. We just, we just lived through it. There wasn't a restaurant. I mean, walk around where this record, recording studio is right now and try to find a... a a restaurant that was formerly wonderful that's open. Right. You can't find any of them. Well, especially not for lunch because they can't figure out a way to turn a profit because no one wants to go around during lunch, you know, during all this craziness. But if you have an indoor mask mandate, you can't run a restaurant. Right. In, in his mind, apparently, I don't know if he thinks that restaurants aren't businesses, but that'd be a pretty big leap. See, and this is the beauty of it. It, this doesn't require any explanation. Ruben, Ruben just shows up with the dunks, dude. So okay, she she is she, she does she best. does she does. But I feel like this is she has this genre of like tweets for three people. That's for like it's for Ron Klain, mm-hmm. and it's it's for you know Pelosi staff RT stuff. It's RT stuff. It's R- RT bait. I don't think it's her high heat. I think it's 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 more run of the mill. If I'm being quite honest, maybe that's not fair. Maybe the standards are higher for Jen Rubin, you know, but well, it's the price you pay for taking Rubin. I've lost on that. I've, I've died on that hill. Dowd takes round two. All right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> soundboard. Great soundboard. <laughs> okay. And a poll came out, uh, on July 20. And, 
It was tweeted out by Ari Berman, who said um, 95% of Arizona Dems approve of Biden, 75% approve of Mark Kelly, but only 42% approve of Senator Sinema. 66% of Democrats said that if given a chance in a 2024 primary, they would vote for a different candidate who would want to get rid of the filibuster. Right. Doubt. Four, four days later, <laughs> jumps on this side. Wait, four days later after this tweet? Yeah. So there's a misuse of internet piece. Going deep. <laughs> so, so four days after this tweet is out, this former Republican advisor writes, couldn't happen to a worse leader, Senator Cinema. Wow. <laughs> couldn't happen to a worse. So like, like this, you know, what these guys fashion themselves as all these Lincoln project idiots and these former like Bush administration guys who are now so, so smart and so liberal is that some, a Democrat who actually like seeks bipartisanship is the worst, the worst leader. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's gone beyond. They've gone from Republican establishment to democratic rabble rouser people who hate the democratic establishment to like AOC alignment. Right. I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing. That's an incredible evolution. Smug. What do you got for us? Boy, there's a lot to choose. <clears throat> Let's see. What, what would land? What would land the best with the judge and jury here? He's reading the judge. Mm. Is it, is it, it's a, uh, I mean, cause she just went on fire this week. There's, there's a lot of heat. And I want to make sure that I have one that'll 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 get me over the top. Here. We might need to institute a shot clock. <laughs> <laughs> I want, okay, I'll go with this one. Uh, so uh, Josh Schwerin, you know, uh, Dem communicator previously on Hillary Clinton's campaign, uh, quote retweets Jonathan Allen, uh, ostensibly a reporter who worked on Dem super PACs, but hey. Uh, Jonathan Allen says, what will the GOP defend if not the Constitution and Capitol? And Josh Warren says, tax cuts. And Jen Rubin replies, white supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a hamburger of dipshittery. <laughs> <laughs> it's a buffet of garbage. I'm just, I'm picturing the tweet, the quote tweet, the quote oh, tweet. Oh, yeah. You see it all at once and it's just like. It's mind blowing. Supremacy. <laughs> I just love how everyone has to up each other for internet points yeah, yep. for RTs. But that it's pathetic. Goes right to a million. Because I mean, the brain, the right. worms were going crazy. No, she plays. She they pl were going crazy. She plays the hits. Yeah. She plays the hits. <laughs> No one's gonna out her like like she, someone comes in with tax cuts. No, yeah. she has to go right for white supremacy. Yeah. The speaker only goes to eleven. That's where she is. <laughs> so, dude, that's it. That's it. I Ruben wins. Go. Smug wins. Ooh, I had no chance. I had no chance. Man, oh. I mean, she, I don't know what it was. The past week, she just went wild. Oh, that's Wild. a big win, dude! I, I'll, I mean, hey, you brought you you brought some artillery yourself. Hats off! I mean, Ruben, my lord, she wasn't doing the thing where she just sort of like retweets other people this week. She was bringing her own hot stuff. <laughs> yep, yep. I mean, a quote tweet on a quote tweet of a tweet is that's it, great. It's really something. It's, you, it's you, so you were, many levels. It's you like were a smart. Lasagna. Yes. Of of of. Lib bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I thought what would get me through with cinema was in part the misuse of the internet. It was a misuse of the internet. And I, and I, so I thought I thought the comp I had a couple other things. I like to that. That, that, that. Yeah, that, that was the playing the metagame. That, that does it, it strikes a chord with the judge and jury. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, but that I can't beat that. I can't beat that. That's that's just that's just a damn good play. <laughs> All right. All right. So we got a big interview. This guy's awesome. He's from my home state of Minnesota. He's the two-time chairman of the National Republican Congressional Committee. Very successful committee over the last three years. Tom Emmer. I want to welcome to the program uh, a whale of a guy and the National Republican Congressional Committee chairman, two-time chairman, Tom Emmer. Hello, sir. Hello, Josh. But I mean, a whale of a guy. I'm working on it, man. I'm sitting right here. Come on, cut me some slack as a fellow Minnesotan. <laughs> it, was not, 
It was not a weight joke, I promise. It was, yeah. a, it was a, a testament to your character, sir. Uh, and as a fellow mini guy, I should probably give you a proper greeting. How are you, pal? I'm doing good, eh? I'm, uh, <laughs> you know, good morning, eh? <laughs> well, listen, off of a, uh, a big win last night, Texas 6, uh, a, a, another Republican. I mean, we, we won it months before, but, you know, you're just chipping away here. Yeah, well, that, you know, the beauty of uh, Texas 6, uh, first off, uh, very sad that we lost Ron Wright. Yeah. A, a true patriot, great man. Uh, cancer got him too early. Uh, but the uh, the runoff last night, you know, you got to go back, like you said a few months ago, that was the result of complete incompetence on the other side. Right. I'd love to say, I'd love to say this was uh, our, our great strategic, you know, uh, a selection and maneuvering, but in <laughs> Uh, Josh, uh, let's it, go with that. Let's go with that. Well, no, I mean, you could, <laughs> or you could say the incompetence down the street where they prefer to invest millions of dollars into a bottom feeding, scum sucking lawyer to try and steal uh, Iowa's second congressional district uh, instead of putting one nickel into uh, Texas Six, which had been targeted before. Uh, they didn't put a nickel into that, uh, into that primary. And as a result, you ended up with two Republicans. So, the, like you say, the race was one. Uh, uh, many weeks ago and we got a great republican joining us uh, very soon named jake elsey you're right we're just chipping away chipping away well listen i i love your analysis of the d triple c i feel like if they can keep up the hard work in that regard we might get to where we need to go so- sooner rather than later huh that's right I, <laughs> it's just uh look they have a different mission apparently we're here to win elections right right exactly so let's talk a little bit about winning elections um there is the conventional wisdom that goes along with the first midterm of the party out of power. It's not just conventional wisdom. It's, you know, there's some statistic, historical statistics that come with it about the number of seats that they were supposed to pick up. But you and I both know that's not the way it, it works in reality. You got to go out there and get it. Um, what are, give me like a top 10. Are, are we, are we, where is your variations of, of what seats are in play and, and how we can win this thing? So let, let me, before I hit that top 10, because we both come from the same state, we both come from my, basically I grew up on a hockey rink, Josh, at the intersection of Highway 62 and Gleason Road. Oh yeah, uh, I know it well. Yeah, when the, it's called the Crosstown, right? It ended right there at Gleason Road. Uh, that hockey rink taught me everything I need to know about life. And one of them is, listen, you might've won in the past, you, you might've had some success, uh, history might tell you certain things, but you got to make your own history. So I got guys around here who are like, oh, yeah, in the first midterm, you know, on average, the party that's been kicked out of the White House picks up somewhere around 27 seats in the House. Uh, you know, redistricting should be very good for us. You know, these guys got to throw all that out. <laughs> that's all on paper. You win this thing on the ground and you got to lean in and make your own history. And we're going to we're going to retire people like Ron Kind in Wisconsin's third district. There you go. You're probably very familiar with Josh. Yeah, absolutely. Ron Kind. I mean, look at this guy. This guy is leasing a a property that he owns to a masseuse, <laughs> who, who, by the way, it has been uncovered. She's a front for her mother, apparently, who's been convicted of uh, sex trafficking in uh, Minneapolis. So she moved the operation apparently across the uh, Saint Croix. Uh, when this is discovered, because, and he should have known, I mean, Josh, there have been multiple nine, 911 calls to this place. Uh, sh- it was being advertised on the new, uh, uh, what, replacement for that website that the Trump administration oh, yeah. took down, uh, what was it, back page? Yep. I mean, there were all kinds of red flags about this operation in Ron Kind when it comes out. What does this guy say? Does he come out and say, you know what, we're going to get to the bottom of this. I'm going to end this thing and get rid of this. I'm, I'm abhorred that somebody would be operating such an establishment out of one of my properties. No, no. Ron Kine said, the NRCC is racist. <laughs> this is an attempt to push Asian hate. This guy's gone. Ron kine has gone. <laughs> Tom Malinowski. The more people that meet Tom Malinowski, the better Tom Kane, who's our candidate, one yeah. of our candidates at least in that district, is going to do. Tom Malinowski, he's broken the law not just once, but twice. I mean, I talked to two for U.S. attorneys that I serve with in Congress, and I told them, you realize that this guy failed to disclose certain stocks in his portfolio on his federal disclosures, which, by the way, are due within the next couple of days again. He <laughs> fails to disclose them, Josh. 
And then he discloses them after he sells them at a, at a major gain. And by the way, it wasn't just, and when he was caught, he blamed it on somebody else. And then guess what, Josh? He did it again. He sold, he sold more stocks that were never disclosed. So, uh, you know, do it once, shame on, on you. Do it twice if we believe you, shame on us. I, the, uh, the two U.S. attorneys I talked to said, uh, jail, bye-bye. That wow. is a criminal violation that would get jail. Wow. Uh, Cindy Axney in uh, Iowa's third district it involves some of the uh, Des Moines yeah. suburbs. At least yeah, right we're now. gonna go. We're gonna go visit that in a couple of weeks. We're gonna do a state fair tour uh, in Iowa, so I'm hoping to check in on that one for you. Well, try to talk to the gaff-ridden uh, Cindy Axney. Every time she opens her mouth, she creates a new problem for herself. The the uh, one of the most recent and most fun is uh, Josh. Incredibly, she told someone on a radio show that running for Congress would be her third choice this cycle. Oh, what? Oh, yes. Oh, she's, she's pretty darn important in her own world. She believes that she probably is a gubernatorial candidate and or a U.S. Senate candidate. I'm sure uh, your experience over in the Senate, you know that Chuck Grassley would be shaking in his boots to get I mean, this. Uh, he, was, this he, he would be very welcoming of such a challenge. <laughs> Then we go to a Texas 15. This is a place where it wasn't on the radar two years ago, right? Uh, but you elect a, a mayor, a Republican mayor in McAllen, Texas, for the first time in 70 years, Josh. If you're not paying attention to that, uh, you're not going to understand this border issue is going to be very important to several races go. along the border. Monica uh, De La Cruz Hernandez uh, came within three points, and she only had, I think, about $400,000 because nobody knew who she was. This race was not on the radar. That was two years ago, or that was last fall. Uh, Monica's going to win this race this time. So there, there are four right there that are not coming back. Then look at Maine, two with Chris Pappas. Look at yep. New Hampshire, one with, I'm sorry, New Hampshire, one with Chris Pappas. Maine, two with Jared Golden. Uh, yep. These guys are guys who, uh, at home, they want everybody to believe that they're this bipartisan or nonpartisan representative, but they come here and uh, more often than not, they're voting with uh, Pelosi. Well, and that's, and that's the thing with all of these incumbents that you're talking about. I mean, basically what they're running on is January 6th and a terrible economy. I mean, that's basically it, right? I mean, they've got no real world sort of understanding of what's happening to people in their district or across the country because they're not even talking about it. Josh, they don't care. Yeah. I mean, let's be realistic. These guys think this game is about running for office, getting elected by telling people what they want to hear. They ran on a fraud back in 18. Remember what they ran on to get in the house? It was, hey, we're going to be moderate problem solvers. Yeah. We're going to go to Washington and we're going to change things. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to fire Nancy Pelosi. Right. Remember that? Yeah. And now this uh, great, this vaunted news crew, if you can call it that around here, I think it's more like uh, glorified blogs in Washington, D.C. There's nothing to see here. They don't report any of that. You know, no. the great double standard when it comes to Republicans and Democrats. We think of them a little bit like stenographers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got news for you. I practiced law for 20 some years. Uh, these stenographers would not get rehired. <laughs> because they improve the sentence structure. I know, I know it works. <laughs> well, listen, we had, um, we had NRSC uh, chairman on a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him about the issues that are sort of driving. You've hinted at this a little bit with the uh, immigration issue. Obviously, in border states is a huge, huge issue. What are some of the other uh, issues that you see bubbling up that people actually do care about? Well, look, it's a target-rich environment. They, they're creating all kinds. You can pick... Uh, from a, uh, a whole uh, cornucopia of issues, uh, which ultimately, when you dig down, you're going to have to to win House races, right? Yeah. Uh, because House races, different from Senate races, gubernatorial races, we're dealing with uh, sections of geography and specific demographics within those sections of geography that may have different uh, uh, what perspectives. Uh, for instance, you know, we won a seat in Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma City uh, uh, and the suburbs uh, yes. because of uh, the attack on fossil fuels. We want to see. We want two seats in the Miami suburbs uh, because of uh, socialism. Uh, the uh, yes. ex-Cuban ex uh, 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 diaspora knows very well what socialism is and why it doesn't work. Uh, we want a seat in Staten Island uh, with Nicole Maliotakis based on defund the police. So ultimately. In house races, you're going to have to find out what that final uh, issue is or that, you know, that enhancing issue. But right now, number one issue, 
is uh, rising costs there and the go. higher cost of living. Yep. I mean, and by the way, it's the suburban voters. Everybody's got this narrative, Josh, that, oh, Republicans don't win in the suburbs. Baloney. We won several seats in the suburbs. We Mike Garcia in the uh, L.A. suburbs. I I just talked about, or I didn't, we talked about the uh, Des Moines suburbs. Well, guess what? Ashley Hinson won in the Des Moines suburbs. Those two seats in Miami are in the suburbs. Uh, the uh, Staten Island seat is a suburban seat, and we can point to others. But it's, uh, it's this idea, those voters that may not have voted for uh, President Trump, all right, they're looking at this with buyer's remorse now, and they're seeing, oh, my goodness. Yeah, no question. Uh, the cost of groceries has gone up. The cost of the pump has gone up dramatically. Uh, this is probably the number one issue, and it will continue to be that because uh, these Democrats, these socialists, are showing no signs of letting up on their uh, their spending thing. In fact, but come on, Josh. The hospitalizations, they, they're giving us words, again, in this vaunted blogosphere media ticking up. <laughs> hospitalizations are ticking up. Well, yeah. I mean, if you get uh, four or five people going to the hospital because they're worried about this, it's not what they told us a year and a half ago, which is it's going to overwhelm the system. There you go. They're, yep. they're, playing, the, they're playing the game again. And I think these people, they'll start with this. They're going to look at uh, crime. Crime across this country, Seventy, almost 75% of Americans say crime has gone up. Uh, our home state, yeah. I believe Minneapolis just set an all-time record for murders. Huh. I wonder why that is, Josh. You think that is because their so-called police reform is actually eliminating police officers and ignoring the rule of law? No kidding. I mean, my goodness. So it's it's those two. And then you get into uh, uh, the uh, it's inflation. It's uh, uh, it, it's the uh, inflation. Oh, where am I going? It's well, the, you got border, and then it's the border crisis. Border issue. Yeah. yeah. Too many hits to the head. But keep in mind the border crisis. The border crisis is really important uh, to a lot of Americans, but more so to Republican voters. It's a very motivational uh, issue for uh, Republicans coming out to vote. And it's a huge issue because, let's face it, I don't care how angry they get when we say it, but everybody knows that the Democrats are now the party of defund the police, and they're the ones that are responsible for the border. No question. We didn't have this problem in January. Well, and, and the and the border issue is multifaceted. We had Shelley Moore Capito last week, and she talked about the impact that, that opioids and fentanyl coming over the border has had on her state, right? right? So it's not just a Texas and Arizona and New Mexico, California thing. I mean, this is, a, this is something where you see drugs traffic, human trafficking uh, across the border in, in that affect actually every community in the country. So you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a really big deal. Right. I, and I, so you do, those are probably the three top ones. We'll see how that goes over the next uh, few months. Uh, but then you're going to throw in another one that I'm going to give to you. Any Democrat that embraces this thing called critical race theory oh, there you, yeah. uh, is going to find it's a major liability to them. There's something boiling underneath the surface. Uh, when you see 200 parents show up at a school board meeting in Loudoun, Virginia, right. and they're, they're upset. I mean, you know, we're going to have the same thing, though, the shirts and skins things where uh, the press is going to try to make Republicans – oh, the CRT is a bad thing, and the Democrats, they'll paint this as, well, this is just the Republicans that are, uh, you know, frankly trying to scare people about this. Uh, yeah, this, uh, well, they have a real problem with that message, though, Congressman, because, I mean, they're, they're split in half, right? Half of the Democrats tell you it doesn't exist, and Republicans are just making it up out of thin air. The other half tell you it's the most important curriculum you could possibly learn, right? Well, so it's like, um, I, I agree. it can't be both. I agree. But from our perspective, where I was going with this, Josh, is I think you got to make this personal to every parent that's out there of, of young children that they're sending to school, because it really isn't a Republican Democrat issue. Uh, it may be on the fringes, but it's definitely not a mainstream American issue. People don't believe we are born automatically racist. And here are the stories. I'll give you one. I just wrote a letter to Janet Yellen yesterday asking her what kind of uh, uh, oversight do they have of CARES money when I have a school that you're familiar with, Sartell, Minnesota. Yeah. Sartell, Minnesota brought in this equity outfit to do a survey of fourth grade students. And Josh, the fourth graders were told not to tell their parents about the survey. What is that, Josh? One, why are we using CARES money for this? I thought CARES money could have been repurposed to retrofit classrooms to get our kids back in school. Right. 
Instead, they sided, they, they ignored the science and they sided with the big teachers unions. Oh, we're not going back. You know, it's not about the children's. It's not about your children. It's about the teachers. Well, we could have made their safety uh, uh, better with the uh, CARES money instead. Now we're finding out they're using CARES money to do equity surveys on the youngest of our students. I'm and so glad you brought that up. To share it with their parents. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. I read that yesterday. I couldn't believe my eyes. These kids essentially were asked to take an equity survey and they had a lot of questions about it because as you might imagine, for those of us who are parents, your kids aren't racist, right? They don't think that way. They're obviously not you know, raised that way in today's society, in, in most houses, hopefully. But, but all of a sudden, they're, they're given all this list of questions. They have a lot of questions. They're like, can we ask our parents? And the teachers in this case in Sartell, Minnesota said, you can't talk to your parents about what we're talking to you about. That's right. That's and incredible. Don't you think, don't you think that will uh, uh, transcend whether your political views are on the right side of the ledger or the left side of the ledger? I would think every totally. parent is gonna say, wait a second, I've got a professional educator that's trying to tell my child that they can't talk to me about what they're being uh, told at school. What else are you keeping from me? Yeah, right, right. And it's gotten Republicans, you're probably seeing this at the congressional level, but what, what I'm seeing across the country is it's gotten conservatives, even the center left, honestly, more engaged in very local politics than I've seen in the very long, like when's the last time you really did a deep dive on your school board, right? But like every parent I know right now knows a lot about the people who are running for their school board. Yeah, you asked the wrong guy that, that question. I, <laughs> I, I will, I'm going to tell you, I've already warned my wife, when I'm done with this job, I'll you're be right. that guy that shows up at every school me board member meeting on Tuesday night, and you're going to just hate to see me sitting in the audience. <laughs> You're going to give them hell every Tuesday. Oh, my God. I'm going to do my homework. I'll have nothing else to do. I'll be that 80-year-old guy that's, uh, you know, happy when I'm not around the school board. And, yeah, that's the guy. <laughs> I You've love seen that. him. You've seen him, Josh. Oh, I've seen him. I've seen him in Minnesota. I know him well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. That's such a nice young man. That little – I'm going to get that little bastard. I'm going to get him. You got to come at sort of nice. You know how that works. No, exactly. It's got to be a little passive aggressive, right? It can't just be a your... little. <laughs> Gosh, Minnesotans did not invent passive aggressive, but we have certainly perfected it. So yeah. don't... <laughs> I'm with you on that. I love it. I love it. So, all right, let's uh, let's get into the three big questions. Uh -oh. I want to because I want to give it time because I know you've got good answers on these. The, the the three big questions that we go with. The first one which I know you've given some thought to, <laughs> is your last meal on earth, what would it be? Well, it would have to be meatloaf. Yeah, there you go. Cabbage salad. I, I mean, I hate these people that call it slaw because it's not slaw. It's cabbage salad. You know, you, you chop it up, right? Or you, you use that, uh, that tool that shreds yeah. it, and then you throw in mayonnaise. Yeah, right? that's right. It's, that's the way you do it. And if you want to spice it up, you know, throw in something that's got a little spice in it. And then, uh, come on, you don't even have to ask this question. You come from the same place I do, tater tots. Tater tots. Yeah, tater tater tots. everybody knows. Do you we have cabbage salad, tater tots? Ah, oh, see, that that's, sounds like a great meal. Yeah. It sounds like a great meal. Keep that darn hot dish away from me, would you? <laughs> yeah, no hot dishes. We can't do that. It's a last meal. It's got to be special. That's right. <laughs> all right. All right. Second question. If you never got into this, if you didn't do the public service thing at all, and you've been doing it uh, at an at extremely high level here for a while, but if you can just wipe that away, what would you be doing with your life? Well, if you talk to anybody back at home, they would probably agree that this is where I wanted to go, which is I would have, uh, I would have continued to skate for a couple more years after uh, college. Uh, and then I would have coached uh, and taught perhaps to begin with. And then uh, I would have loved to have ended up, ended up uh, running a team and putting uh, teams together and competing. But uh, funny thing happened on my way to that life, Josh. I met a gal that the first time I met her, we just celebrated our 35th wedding anniversary on Sunday. And the first oh, time I saw Jackie, I actually talked, and I can give you his name, I'm not going to, but I could. I told one of my good friends the very next morning, I'm marrying that girl. And that changed the whole thing. You know, when you have seven kids, it kind of limits your choices, Josh. It wasn't like I could go out and just, you know, 
get paid uh, fifteen thousand a year to start coaching at whatever level it was. So that's right. You know, that's probably what I would have done. And this has kind of replaced it. You know, I tried cases for twenty years. That replaced the competition, standing in front of juries and uh, and working. And this this is a lot. The uh, campaign side to me is a lot like coaching. I want to rewind the tape on that, Tom. You got seven kids. Yep. Seven kids. Yeah, you don't see that a lot in today. And one daughter, Josh. <laughs> oh man, you, yeah. you had. I'm sure you have had had an incredibly raucous household. Oh my God, Jackie used to call it organized chaos. <laughs> Somebody asked, once asked me when I was running for a different job. They're like, "Well, what qualifies you to run a major corporation?" I said, "You ever try to feed a family of seven? You ever try to get them to all their activities? I mean, they're all within eleven years. Good luck to you, man. I can run anything. If you can coordinate that, your logistics are going to be perfect and yep. everything else." <laughs> All right, Tom Hammer, what motivates you more, the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat? So Josh Holmes from Minnetonka, Minnesota. Yeah. I was raised uh, with guys like Herb Brooks, right? Uh, where it's, uh, we, didn't, we didn't get the same type of sensitivity training that you're given today, right? Uh, it wasn't about my feelings back then. Uh, but I'll tell you, when you weren't successful because you were built for success, it's that feeling, that awful, sick feeling, that empty feeling of losing. I am more afraid of that feeling than anything else on the face of the planet. So uh, I would say the fear of losing drives me more than any uh, joy of winning. In fact, when I played in college at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, they asked me this the other day in preparation for your, uh, your interview. I told them, you have no idea. It's 30 below on a uh, January, late January night, if we lost, I would walk home outside because I'd be so pissed off and upset. I love and that. And it's like, you know, why I'm here today, I don't know. The good Lord wanted me to suffer more pain because I should have frozen to death years ago. <laughs> I, love, I love that answer. That's a good true thing we didn't lose too much, Josh. <laughs> it's a true Minnesota right there. I mean, also, by the way, Hats off to your staff prepping for the Ruthless interview, huh? Oh, I don't know. I, if, if you saw the stuff that hit the cutting room floor, oh, no, you can't say that. No, 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 no. You can't say that. No, no, no. Listen, we want you to have fun, but we Not don't too want much. to get in trouble. <laughs> Not too much. <laughs> right. You ever been there, Josh? <laughs> oh, uh, occasionally, occasionally. Uh, listen, this has been awesome. I, if, if it's possible for us to do this, kind of throughout the cycle to get updates from you. This is about as clear and concise a breakdown of the seats that we ought to be looking at as we've had. And we really appreciate your time. Hey Josh, I, I really enjoyed it. I look forward to the next time. And don't, anybody wants to uh, help us out, uh, just tell them, visit TakeBackTheFive.com. TakeBackTheFive.com. Yep, remember, we need five seats. TakeBackTheFive.com. TakeBackTheFive.com. We got it. We'll send people that way. And listen, NRCC Chairman Tom Emmer, thanks for your time. Thank you, Josh. Have a great afternoon. So I had a, I, look, I had a blast interviewing. <laughs> you can probably tell. Like, I was laughing most of the time. This is a dude you can just hang out with. You know? I, <laughs> I loved how he, he came out immediately with the joke on the whale thing. But... <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> he came to play, he which did. I appreciate so much about, you know, people who come in. Uh, to be to be interviewed on the variety program is you know I feel like the longer we do this the more people get a sense of you know the cut of our jib yeah well I liked how he was like yeah we prepared for this we so prepared great. for this you know it's like gosh it's come a long way fellas <laughs> it's come a long way <laughs> what a great episode I mean another fabulous job gentlemen this episode's yet another banger added to the list outstanding work everyone we, we came with a lot of a lot of veggies a lot of anger but we also you know wrapped it up with some candy and a good interview so until next time minions keep the faith hold the line and own the libs we'll see you on tuesday stay ruthless <laughs>